E aí, cachorreiros e gateiros? No vídeo de hoje, uma entrevista maravilhosa com a doutora Sandra Macun. Ela que é especialista em comportamento animal do Instituto de Walton, que fica na Inglaterra. E o fato dela ser inglesa, a nossa entrevista foi em inglês, mas eu vou deixar a legenda aqui embaixo para você poder acompanhar essa entrevista. Foi tão legal que foi um pouquinho comprida. Por isso, eu vou dividir em dois vídeos. Um hoje e o próximo na semana que vem. So I work at the Waltham Centre for Pet Nutrition and that's based right in the middle of, the, of England in the UK and it's a global centre for Mars Pet Care. So at Waltham what we do that's different if you like from the rest of the business is it's the centre where we do fundamental research uh, looking at you know, nutritional needs of our pets and making sure that we're doing science that will, uh, can be applied and put into product um, to make best optimal nutrition that we can for for pets and to make sure that they're going to live you know healthy active lives we work mainly with dogs and cats but we also have other species as well so we work on fish and we also work on horses and historically at least we've done a lot of work on, on birds so we have the same sort of program in those areas where we're looking at um, things like their metabolism um, digestion their feeding behavior, uh, what do they like and why, um, their genetics. But the area actually that I'm particularly involved with at Waltham is in human-animal interaction. So understanding the bond and the relationship that grows between people and their pets. And the animals used in this kind of research, uh, they are from the institute or they have their owner and go there just for the research? So we have animals that are resident and stay. They live at the Waltham Center. And some of those are bred at the center as puppies and kittens. And, and then some of them uh, come from outside. So for example, our latest breed that we have is the Norfolk Terrier, which is a sort of small breed about so high. Uh, we didn't have that, any Norfolk Terriers before. So obviously we needed to bring all the puppies uh, from outside into that. So we have a lot of Norfolk Terrier puppies at the moment who are incredibly cute. <laughs> they're, really, they're really lovely. Uh, but the same with the, the, the cats and the kittens. Um, you know, so um, some of them come from outside. They do get homed when they're about eight years of age, uh, for example, then they become available for homing. We have long waiting lists uh, from our associates for both dogs and cats, and I'm on my third Waltham cat at the moment. <laughs> and how can you be there, not play with them just for research? <laughs> or you can play with them? How is yeah. your day there? Yeah. So we do get to play with them, <laughs> um, and it's great because actually if you do just want a little bit of time out, you can actually go and, and have contact. But we also have the dogs in particular are coming through the office all of the time. So in terms of, of they, their day there, all of the, the dogs and cats will be on trials. Uh, we're looking um, at different sorts of studies, looking at their, their feeding preferences, could be looking at a particular uh, nutritional requirement So a recent study, for example, was um, trying to establish exactly what the vitamin A requirements were for growing dogs. So we had a lot of puppies right up until they were about two years of age um, and looking at trying to refine the standards um, in the guidelines for nutritional requirements. Previous to that, it had been based on a range of studies which were very different from each other. And so we were asked, would we do this trial which would really be the definitive study, if you like, on working out actually what do growing dogs need in terms of vitamin D. Um, so, we, so we had that. So they'll be on, on a trial, but in addition to that, we try and make their life there as pet-like as possible. And, and they have a great life. So they all have um, a handler who they are assigned to, who they can get to know really well and bond with. You know, they're great. And they take them out, they, they go for walks every day, they may do agility. You know, if they're particularly uh, keen to do that, then they may go on and do special qualifications in that. And they will also come through the office throughout the day and just have social contact with, with lots of people. You know, they tend to be really, really friendly. And so, yeah, I use it as a cue for myself just to stop work for a moment when a dog comes by and to have a little interaction and a play um, and then go back refreshed to the work I'm doing. <laughs> and how is the routine of the research? Like I have the dog and I have to 
uh, look what he's doing how is that so we have yeah we have all sorts of trials and dogs are selected depending on what the needs of the trials are um, so we have at the moment um, we have about 300 dogs there at the moment um, and we have about the same number of cats um, it goes up and down depending you know on what the the needs are and the age are um, of the dogs and cats that we have and so the first thing really um, is deciding on actually what is the research question that we have. That's the key thing, long before we actually get to selecting which animals should be on it. And we do that um, and decide which question we want to go after by looking at the scientific literature, seeing where the gaps are in the science, in our understanding, um, getting information from the rest of the business, getting information from owners, you know, what are their needs that aren't currently being met in product um, that they, they may need a solution to. And understanding cons consumers as well is a really important part of that. So we decide what the question is and then it goes through a process of looking at is the quality of the science absolutely sound, you know, is it the best it can be? And we do that internally and then we have external experts to do that and to review the science. We also put it through our ethics review assessment. So I sit on that um, and it's chaired by my colleague and every single research study, uh, no matter how small, gets put through an ethics, very stringent ethics review. And we just ask those questions, you know, do we really need to do this work? Is it going to answer the question that we're asking? Um, you know, is there any potential impact on the animal that we wouldn't want? Can we do it in a different way? You know, how many animals should we be using? And what kind of animals should we be using? And so if it passes all of those hoops, <laughs> then we'll actually get to the stage of selecting the best individual animals for a particular trial. And it depends what it is. So if it is a study that's looking at, for example, well, like the vitamin A study, the growth of a puppy, obviously we need to be breeding puppies for that kind of a trial. And so we'll, we'll be you know, producing a, a lot of very young dogs and watching them as they grow. And uh, we may be looking at different levels of a nutrient in the food. So we'd be following you know, different cohorts of, of dogs um, that are maybe on different diets and watching exactly how they grow and taking a whole range of measurements of not just growth, but also of health um, and how they're doing right, right through you know, until whatever the end point is. So it's the science that obviously drives which individuals end up on a particular trial. Um, but we work very closely with our animals from when they're, even before they're born, to make sure that they are really adaptable, very friendly, well-adjusted animals, so that actually it doesn't really matter, you know, what we ask of them, that they're very happy to just to work with us in a whole range of ways. So anything we would ask them to do, they're very comfortable in doing that from a very young age. And one um, line of research that you mentioned was the human-animal relationship. Mm. And I have a really particular <laughs> interest in this kind of, in this area. So uh, Walton is nowadays, is nowadays with 50 years. Yeah, just over, yes, it is. Yeah, great. <laughs> Which is the biggest difference between human-animal relationship nowadays and 50 years ago? Mm, that's a great question. Um, it's changed hugely, actually. So I think the biggest difference is that we've stopped keeping our dogs outside in the back garden or in the yard, and we've brought them into our homes and even onto our beds, or maybe sometimes even in our bed. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that really is a huge change. And people have changed in how they understand the role of the, the dog uh, or the cat in their family. So people will usually, nowadays, in really most countries in the world, they will describe their pets as family members. And they see them in a very different way. You know, they, they treat them in, in many ways like a really integral part of the family. They may celebrate their birthdays, they may give them gifts. You know, they spend a lot of time with them. And particularly a lot of their leisure time is invested uh, often with, with their pets. So the things that have gone alongside that have been the shift to a much higher proportion of owners feeding complete and balanced nutrition and also providing um, appropriate health care for, for cats and dogs. And so cats and dogs, because of those two things, good nutrition and better health care, are living much longer 
and actually living much better lives, I would say, as well. Are dogs and cats learning new ways to communicate with their owners? Well, I would love to say yes, <laughs> but actually, I don't know that I can say that. I think, um, you know, some people are really good, I think, at, at, at reading their, their dogs. Less so cats, I, I think, although I absolutely love cats. I think they're just more subtle in the way that they signal. And that comes really from the way they've evolved. So, you know, dogs have evolved to be a part of a social group. It's very important for them to be able to signal to the other members of their pack, you know, this is how I am, this is how I'm feeling, this is what I want from you, this is what I'm going to do. It's very important just to maintain harmony in that pack that they've got clear signaling. Um, with cats, you know, they're much more solitary. They've evolved to be much more solitary, although they can be in groups. And so the signals that they give out are much more subtle. So, you know, you and I may know that cats have nine different ear positions, but to the average person, that may be missed. <laughs> you know, it's quite subtle. And so they are more subtle. And I think even with dogs, though, they are fantastic at reading our body language. That much we know from studies is very clear. Cats and dogs are very good at reading our body language. I think generally people aren't that great at it. And I think that's where really some of the misunderstanding can come um, or people have expectations that maybe aren't realistic and may misinterpret you know, what they're seeing, some, some of the time at least. So I'd like to think that we are continuing to work with people to help people understand that. I think people are quite keen to understand that. Um, but I think we have a way to go yet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how this kind of research that you do in Walton can help the owners and the animals to be more happy? To be more happy? I think certainly, um, you know, some of the research that's done at Waltham, both within the team that I work in, um, on the bond, but I think also in our animal behaviour and welfare team, actually they're doing some very nice work now, really understanding what are the needs of uh, pets generally. But I think if you take something like, say, cats that are kept exclusively indoors, which we see now is more and more common around the world, you know, people are often concerned about letting their cats out because they're vulnerable, you know, particularly on roads, um, but vulnerable to predators as well. Um, and so there is that question of how can you make um, an indoor cat's life really good? Um, and I firmly believe that that's possible. Um, and we're beginning to really understand the need for indoor cats to have choices in their environment about where they go, what they do, particularly how close they are um, with other cats in particular, but also toddlers, you know, little children, particularly if they're in the household, cats in particular, just having somewhere where they can go, where they can be quiet and sleep, sleep in peace. Um, but also the importance of play um, in that. It's great for your bond, but it's actually really important, particularly, I think, for indoor cats when they're not getting the stimulation of going outdoors. And so that stimulation needs to be, you know, more obviously provided by the owner. And we know that even in indoor cats from studies, we know that those cats are more likely to actually initiate contact with people and to look for that stimulation from their owner when they're indoors all day. The cats are continually evolving. Uh, the evolution is um, starting in a different way. Can we talk about socialization in cats? Yes, I think um, it's a big difference between dogs and cats. So, you know, we think of, of dogs as, as very much domesticated, um, which they are, you know, and we largely control a lot of their breeding. They are very, very different from their ancestral species, the wolf. Um, but actually, cats are in a very different place on that. So we might think of them more appropriately as being partly domesticated. You know, originally, we invited cats into our homes really to control you know, rodents. Um, and then later, that, that came about as companionship, as more of a reason. And still in many parts of the world, you know, their breeding is still very largely uncontrolled by people, which is, which is one of the factors in domestication. Um, 
And so what we see with cats is um, they're, very, they're flexible in their behavior and they have the behavioral tools, if you like, to be friendly and to form really strong bonds with owners. But they also can be very independent and they're still capable of living independently on their own outside if, if they needed to be, you know, so they have those, those tools, um, which is something that's very different, you know, most dogs just could not do that. And so it might be worth thinking about actually where are they evolving to, where, you know, where would full domestication lead them to? And I think one of the things that it probably would take them to is to select for friendliness, um, and also probably to select for low predatory drive if we want them to be, you know, good pets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the research are not only in the UK. You no. do the research in, in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So what's the main difference or what are the difference between the countries like UK and Brazil? And yeah. <laughs> Yes, so we do global research and within hu human-animal interaction specifically, um, we are, most of our work is either in North America or Europe or Australia. Um, we've done some work in Brazil, but not a lot yet. Um, hopefully there might be some more in the future. And there, and there certainly are some differences. So you do see cultural differences and you see uh, differences as well in terms of the stage of development, if you like, of the pet ownership. Um, industry and how long a country uh, have kept pets for um, so that so that can differ and I think you know if we if we look at somewhere like Brazil in, in terms of my understanding anyway of Brazil you know I think what we're seeing compared to say somewhere like the UK is that um, we wouldn't see as many cats say fed prepared pet foods here and probably not as many accessing the health care um, that they, they need so, you know, that I'm sure will shift over time um, and, there, and there'll be changes. Um, but it's interesting, we, we've just done a study on uh, a topic called social capital, which is really about all the connections in a community and the role that pets play in forging those connections. And partly it was a repeat of work in Australia that was done 10 years ago, but we also added three US cities to it as well. Um, and what we found was interesting that the work remained basically the same in Australia, so even over time it remained consistent. But that there was a lot of consistency actually across all of those cities. So in, I mean, okay, there's quite a lot of similarities in some ways in pets between Australia and the US, but there were also some differences. But we found basically in the way that the role that pets play in deepening those connections between people and communities and getting them connected was very, very similar. Like family? Like family, but also what we found, for example, was when you're out with your dog, you'll know if you're, you know, if you're out with your dog, people talk to you. And we know that. They talk to you more, you know, they talk to you for longer and all of these things. But actually, it goes beyond just that, oh, hi, you know, that's Fido's mom, who I recognize because she walks Fido every day. And if you study those communities, what you find is that those develop into real friendships and that um, you know, measurable forms of social support start to emerge between those people. So they meet because of the pet, but then it goes far beyond that. So it really deepens the, the strength of the community ties. And what I think is fascinating in this latest bit of research is that's not true just for dog owners, although it's strongest for dog owners, as you might expect. But even cat owners and other species, if they have them at home, they become a topic of conversation that forges these connections between owners um, and builds those bonds within a community. E não se esquece de se inscrever no canal.